Well, hi, you two. So this is a comic book club, graphic novel club, whatever it's called. And we have my dinosaur. It, this was so organic right before we started recording. I don't know what happened. Uh, but anyway, a little bit of a late start for the graphic novel club. Uh, regardless, though, we're going to have a discussion today over Paul is Dead. And uh, this is a book which focuses on the myth that was perpetuated in the mid-60s that Paul McCartney died while the Beatles were in the height of their career and he was replaced with a duplicate. Uh, before we get into the main questions about this, let's open up the table. Folks, what were your general thoughts about this graphic novel? Oh, sorry, I was just watching videos about the conspiracy because I was like, there's no way people believe this. This is total bullshit. No, they believed it. They believed it for years. Some what? people still believe it. Like, I can't even. Anyway. Paul McCartney's dead and the earth is flat. Yep. Oh <laughs> did, did, young, did young women actually kill themselves? There, oh. That is true. Oh my God. When the Beatles broke up, I, people have embellished the story a lot, but young girls did actually commit suicide. They were so distraught over the band oh. breaking up. I didn't know that. Hmm. Wow. Uh, I, I guess I should count myself lucky I was only into NSYNC and Backstreet Boys at that young, impressionable age. How how broken up were you when they stopped making albums? <laughs> I don't even think I noticed. <laughs> <laughs> Best I answer. Say, I can safely say that my childhood version of this would have been David Lee Roth leaving Van Halen, mm -hmm. and then Duran Duran splitting up into Power Station and whatever the other one was. That was like the most depressing time of my life. One of my two favorite bands basically broke up. But anyway. See, like yours, yours sounds way cooler than mine because I think the one that struck me the most was Blink-182 and the Spice Girls breaking up. Like I think those were the two most <laughs> powerful ones of my age. <laughs> I think I listened to a lot of alt rock because it really, I was really depressed when I found out the new Radicals wouldn't be making anything beyond that one album. So. That was it for me. I was in high school. Do you remember New Radicals? That it's like one more chance. I, actually, I forget the lyrics. You get what you give. Yes, thank you. Oh. Um, because they remade it. Somebody sampled it recently, and it's garbage. Mm -hmm. So, anyway, that's just my opinion. <laughs> so, actually, we should reel this back. We are talking about a graphic novel, supposedly. <laughs> So let's talk about it. Paul is dead. Um, I, I don't know what you thought about this. Uh, as far as I know, this is Palalo's, uh, sorry, Palalo Baron's debut graphic novel. Uh, I, I haven't. Have more information on him, but I did. So that's all accurate. This book was a bad trip. <laughs> it was a bad trip. Like there was a, literally a point where I was like, "Am I on acid? Like, what is this?" Are we just giving like opening remarks? Yeah, just general impressions. Okay, because I uh, read Batman number two twenty two in preparation, and I actually enjoyed that much more. And um, man, I gotta say, I kind of hated this comic. I, I kind of hated the story. The art, I, there's a lot to say about the art. There's some things I liked and some things I didn't. But yeah. as far as like taking the time to paint however many pages of this story and it amounts to absolutely nothing was in, to me infuriating. Like you could sum up the entire plot in one or two sentences. Well, right. And it just comes down to like, okay. Okay, so I look at the cover. Paul is dead. It's like, okay, so I know what really... This is kind of like uh, Tarantino's uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. It's like, I know what really happened. Now we're going to do an alternative history. So it's like, well, I want to see the story of what would have happened if Paul actually did die, because that's an interesting idea. Mm -hmm. But instead, we're just going to do the exact same story, except instead of the audience believing he's dead, the Beatles believe he's dead for a couple hours, and then he's actually alive. That's it. And to me, that is just a, a big, I don't know what, F you to the reader. I don't know. But that's just me. Like, oh. I was a little bit intrigued at first because I'm like, 
oh, are they actually going to replace him with a doppelganger? And, right. and how's this going to work? Like, I was a little bit intrigued to see how it was all going to play out. But then, like you said, it did. It felt like a giant middle finger. Like, oh, you went all through all that work for nothing. <laughs> like, Yeah, like, if you just think about, okay, let's, you know, if you're a writer, you're like, okay, I'm going to use my imagination. You would take all the Beatles albums after, say, Sgt. Pepper and go, here are all the little inconsistencies that we can exploit like mm -hmm. Paul was turned backward on Sgt. Pepper he was the only one without shoes in Abbey Road and we can maybe show how those things happen or they could be like oh maybe Paul's plastic surgery hasn't healed so let's turn him around and at least they could have tried to come up with creative explanations or like maybe little lyrics or maybe there was one song where Paul's voice sounded different and it's like oh here's proof it wasn't Paul but instead it's like we're just going to have an excuse to have this melodrama and this fist fight. Mm. I don't know. That was just, it was a, I thought it was a waste. And, and another thing that kind of bothered me was, and some of this stuff feels a little cheap to me sometimes, how they just, at the end, when they had him tripping out so that, you know, Paul looked like a, a what was it, a hippopotamus? Hippopotamus, yeah. And, John was the walrus and he was quoting the song lyrics directly and I was like come on like, right right it was not subtle at all I liked how they had Paul quote some lyrics and I actually am not familiar with that song so it was a little more seamless I, I guess to say where John actually quoting the walrus I was like you know just hit us over the head with it why don't you like he's right. a walrus and he's quoting the walrus like it just I don't know. I, I I felt like it could have been done a little better. Uh, Julie, what were your thoughts? Um, I actually liked the art. It was, it was probably a gigantic waste of time for the artist. Um, <laughs> it, well, I mean, not a waste of time. This art is like beautiful. It's like Ben Temple Smithy, um, but bright. Um, like. Oh, it, I, it, it, every every frame is a painting. Mm -hmm. I usually don't like digital art, but there are different qualities about the the digital painting that remind me of the way we were taught to use. Or um, actually, it's more like digital drawing. Uh, uh, just like the scratches mm -hmm. uh, on over top of. Um, what is supposed to be like wet media. It just looks really cool. I have never seen a book like this before. And uh, it wasn't like totally wasted on this weird, sorry, I'm like flipping through it while we're talking, but like it wasn't totally wasted on the story. The story was, t I thought we were going to get like a detective story because I honestly have never heard this conspiracy theory. I was like, whoa, this is like messed up. Is this some kind of like fan fiction that I'm reading? That's really weird. So instead of John Lennon dying, Paul dies? Okay, so I, I thought we would get like a little more from that, but um, that it's, and the, that's for me just assuming that it was a take on Paul dying instead of John. So I didn't really understand it until after where I read that it was an actual conspiracy theory and I thought, oh boy, this shit's real. Um, and now that I'm, now that I've sort of looked into the conspiracy theory and I'm flipping through it again, I agree with what Alicia and Mike are saying about it is that it's kind of like, it, it, it's a, it's like a cheap one-off version mm -hmm. of what it could be. It's not as voluptuous as it should be. It's like the frame of a really good detective, detective story. Cause like. What they could have, what what they were doing with Paul seemed way more insidious to me, uh, because I had no background with the conspiracy theory. So I was like, did like Interpol collaborate with somebody to replace Paul McCartney? Why would they do that? Like, what is this author going to how? What is the author going to spin to make this a plausible story? But that like that even that never happened. So. Yet once I found out that it was because this actually happened, like this car accident actually happened, and that rumor was that he was completely decapitated. <laughs> Ooh, now I get it, but it could have been way cooler. It just could have been way cooler. 
you, you know, I agree with the consensus so far. My main issue with this is that I think there was room to tell an incredible story mm-hmm. in the fact that if you follow this myth, you could have had a couple of different storylines going on. The impersonator, what would it have been for this person to be someone they're not for their entire lives, especially being such a huge celebrity? When the Beatles broke up, maybe there could be a fictionalized fallout where they left the band because they did not want to continue the lie and working with these people they didn't know. Uh, you know, also you could have tracked the guilt, uh, the grief that the surviving members of the Beatles went through. There was a lot of potential, and I just feel the word to pin this down is frustration. It was a frustrating read because there was such potential for great storytelling, narrative elements. And I do agree with Jolie. I think the art is actually the strongest point about the book. It's done by Ernesto Carbonetti. And uh, his panels, even those I have issues with because while I think the individual panels work, I don't know if it works sequentially. And I'm wondering about your feelings on that. Who, Julie, or anyone? Uh, anyone. I'll, I'll just say I don't think it works sequentially at all. It felt like, uh, like number one problem was not using the page properly where you're reading four words per page and you're skipping and skipping and skipping. And uh, it just felt like is a disconnect where you're looking at a pretty picture, but it's not really telling the story or matching what the dialogue is you, most of the time. So I just thought it was a waste. No, I agree. Like, there was a moment, and I'm trying to see if I can find it. I think it was towards the end when uh, John was kind of tripping out, and you see him silhouetted in front of these beautiful, vibrant boxes of color, and you see him kind of doing this weird arm shimmy thing. And the point of good action, like, I've read books that, that graphic novels that portray the action seamlessly, so it almost feels like the character is actually moving across the page. But in this moment, like like Mike said, I feel like it could have been used a little more, a lot better and, and made it, because I had to look at those images several times before I figured out, oh, he's, he's dancing, you know, or right, he's, right, right. you know, like if I can find it, I'll, I'll hold it up for you. But, oh, no, wait, there it is. That's right. That's right. He was upside down and they pulled him down and he's standing around drunk walking, spinning because right. he's a little bit, uh, a little bit disoriented after being upside down for so long but it wasn't obvious at first and you get like half the page of that like what's the point of that how is that furthering the plot at all right like so like i like the art but i feel like again like you could have summed the book up in two sentences and i i hate to say this but it, it could have been the same with the art you could take half the pictures out and tell a more concise story with half the pictures gone. Mm -hmm. I would say individual panels worked really well. In fact, I would even say some of the panels would make incredible exhibits themselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, Early on in the book, though I don't have a page reference, there's uh, Brian Epstein, I believe it is, and uh, John Lennon. And they're on the roof as he's being broken the news that Paul McCartney was in a car crash and he died. And there's this view of Epstein pointing out over the street while Lennon is sitting on the rooftop. I think that scene is gorgeous. And I think Mm -hmm. as an individual framed image, it's breathtaking. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of images like that in the book. So on one hand, I agree a lot. Yep, that's the one. I agree I agree a lot with Jolie where I think, yes, the art is good. And I think it's the strongest thing about the book. Yes. But on the other hand, as a sequential piece of art, I don't think it achieves what it needed to. Right. I, it's interesting because, like, I feel like, um, I don't know, it's like I just reviewed uh, Sandman with, with um, a guy named Mike Dell, and he thought it was pretentious, blah, 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 you know, uh, uh, English, like, English uh, call, uh, class BS, and I feel like, and I, I disagree with him, but I feel like so many graphic novels are, I, I think it, the way I could say it best is I feel like the average graphic novel is at the point that like, uh, 
film was like maybe 50 years ago of like, <clears throat> like they don't, it's like no one knows what to do with the medium. Even though we're inching towards better quality, there's still so many, there's so much talent. Like this artist, obviously he's technically a good artist, yes. but it's almost like he doesn't know how to use the medium. And it's almost like if you look at, say, Hollywood in the 1950s, the lighting was perfect, the sound was perfect, there was a million lights, they, they knew how to do everything perfect, but the content was like nothing. And that's what I feel like we're at with a lot of uh, graphic novels. Or I, it's like I want, I want to, it's like when I, when I heard we were doing Paul is Dead, I was like, oh, I can lend this to my dad, I can lend this to my uncle. I don't want them to read this, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> they must be protected. <laughs> yeah. Well, it reminds me, like, as you were saying that, Mike, a little bit. Because, yes, the artist is absolutely talented, but it's like he's never done a graphic novel before. And he, he, I'm sure he would have benefited from some guidance, like like almost right. like a director, just to, you know, give him a few little nudges or, or a good editor. Like, I, I don't know what the equivalent of an editor would be for an artist. Uh, but, you know, like, it, not to say that people can't do well for their very first graphic novel because I, I remember the best we could do that we did last month. That was incredible. That was her first graphic novel and it, it was very well done. I was very impressed, you know, between the art and the story and was it perfect? No, but this, it, the, the story does an injustice to the artist and it reminds me a little bit of, yes, we're going back there, but Angel Catbird. Because the art for that was very good. They had a very competent artist on board, and it's almost like they were riding on that. I do want to break some bad news. Unfortunately, this is not the first graphic novel by this pair. Oh. Paolo Barron and Ernesto Carbonetti actually have released a series previous to this, and I just found out about this now while reading it. It's called Punk is Undead. What if rock legends come back from the dead? Oh boy. This is almost better than Angel Catbird. Sarcasm. I was going to say that sounds about like as interesting to me as Jolie, what's that comic? Uh, Wicked and the Divine. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Just more, uh, more, yeah, whatever. I don't want to say. Rip offs, like, yeah. Whatever. I don't know. I don't, I wouldn't say that I'm like, that this is, that he's a terrible storyteller at all. Um, well, maybe he just has no story to tell because the <laughs> script is so bad. I don't know. Yeah, like if you look at the actual like techniques of storytelling, the panels are at least graphically positioned well. Like there's only three here, but oh, oh, it's, sorry, I'm out of focus, but. Hmm. Okay. I'll try to put it by my face. What is going on? Is it ble- oh, it's, I think it's, it's you like- have your background blurred out. Yeah. Out. So if you oh, hold okay. it in front of yourself, it's good. Yeah, that's there, good. there you go. Dang it. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that, that's good. I mean, yeah. Like most and most of it's like this. It, it's kind of oh, he as an artist gets the concept of composition and panels that work together, not necessarily in a comic book way, um, mm. like in a comic book storytelling way, but he understands that he's telling a story and that the compositions or the panels need to look good together. And that's why I, I can't sit here and listen to him be despair. Like, <laughs> yeah, like, um, I will not take it. Like, <laughs> this is good. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, that's why we talent. read physical books. Stupid I'm not, digital I'm not stuff. denying that he doesn't have talent. He absolutely has talent. I'm yeah. just saying that he could have used a good solid edit to just say, pare this down just a little bit, you know, like get this a little bit more on point. That that's all I'm saying, you know. Well, like it's like reading a novel where the writer just goes on and on and on without saying anything, and it feels like they're trying to reach their nano goal, right? Their word count goal. All, all they really need is a good edit to get it more straight to the point to make it a little bit cleaner. Mm-hmm. I would I say know. in terms of his ability to have sequential art, it's functional. I, I do agree. There's some really good uh, sections within the book. I do think the images are stronger taken individually out of the context of the sequence. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think given a good script, 
-hmm. with actual characterization and an interesting story, I think Ernesto could be a really good artist. Like I see nothing but promise and potential in this book. Um, that and was a beautifully laid out page. Yeah, that was. Great example, yeah. Julie. That's, yeah. why I, that's why I think that it's not completely his fault. I honestly yeah. think I agree with Adam where he needed a better script. He needed a much better script because I'm not going to say this art is flawless, but it's practically flawless. It is really good. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. he clearly, not only is he good with color and composition, but he's also good at likenesses. Like there's mm -hmm. some likenesses in here that are incredible, right? So. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, let's talk about the narrative. Uh, getting away from just the form or the medium of comics, as a narrative, as a story, like what were your feelings about it? Um, namely, did you feel like there was a narrative going on? Because I'm going to tell you from my perspective, I didn't really feel that there was one. No. No. I Especially because I compared it to Batman. <laughs> and let's be clear, uh, the Batman story was obviously probably meant for kids. And it's very simplistic, but just to give a two-minute summary, uh, this band, not called the Beatles, called the Twists, have a member that there is rumored to be dead. And so Bruce Wayne invites the band to, his, to Wayne Manor because Robin is going to try and prove that, that this guy is actually a replacement. And of course, because, you know, the, the guy who's writing this knows how to do his job. He's like, well, I've got a story, so I've got to fill 20 pages. So I've got to have X number of things happen. So there's going to be this clue and this clue and this clue. And Robin's going to try and do X, Y, and Z. And each time Robin tries to prove that he's a fake, something goes wrong. And then at the end, I won't give it away, but there's a twist. And it's like, even if you consider that a childish whatever commercial product at least it's like the writer frank robbins is doing his job and when you're done you feel like okay i spent 20 minutes and i got my 20 minutes out of it but when you read this yeah it's like you said what is the narrative what is the story it's like it's like the the, the disparity in quality between the story and the art is like this you know mm -hmm. i don't know you almost wonder if it's like these two guys knew each other or maybe the writer is like okay, I got some money and you're a good artist. I'm just going to pay you to do my story. Or maybe they're friends. I have no idea. But you wonder why this artist doesn't realize how weak this story is, you know? Mm -hmm. um, no, I agree. Maybe they're the same person. Yeah. <laughs> There's another conspiracy. conspiracy. Yeah. Um, do you know what I found really disappointing? Um, Adam mentioned character, the way that they were characterized. And I was like, okay. I feel like the Beatles were iconic enough to know, or iconic enough that we all sort of know what kind of people they were. And I didn't get any Beatles from this other than their likenesses. Like, yeah. right. And it was almost, I don't know if the, like, and now knowing that they did like a punk sort of, oh uh, God, series. It's like, are they too in love with the Beatles that, like, it didn't come off? They just, the, all of these characters came off as stilted and hollow? Or do they not know enough to, or th they just knew the bare minimum about John, that he was sort of like an eccentric sort of musician mm -hmm. that he would hang upside down? Like, that's that one, they really focused on that. And um, up in the back, there's a lot of sketches for just him hanging upside down. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was really strange, and I was like, oh, so they, they took a lot of, like, cool musician stories and, like, infused them. Like, oh, Pink Floyd was in the studio that day. Pink Floyd was in the story! Like, did they do yeah, the bare minimum like... of research because they actually don't care for the Beatles? Like, I don't, I don't understand, anyway. It's almost like they were trying to pat themselves on the back and be like, look how knowledgeable we are. I bet you didn't know this really cool factoid. And it's like, okay, calm down. Stop name dropping. That's, that's exactly what I meant when I said it's like film school level or, or English, you know, uh, degree level where you're in that phase where you're name dropping and referencing mm -hmm. and showing off your vocabulary or showing off your subtle film references or whatever and that's exactly what that is it's like oh if you if you research it pink floyd did actually walk by them in the hallway and it's like yeah i don't really care i'm not impressed you know 
Like, that has no bearing on the story unless Pink Floyd killed Paul. Like, yeah, exactly. That would have been a great twist. Yeah, that twist would have been a great twist. <laughs> like if they're taking liberties, if they're because they're clearly insinuating that Paul is dead. If that's the stance that they're taking, just go all out and be like, Pink Floyd killed him. That's who they're conspiring with. Like, Interpol, right. the CIA, they're all like, let's get rid of... And, like, they had to get rid of John for, like, a really good reason. Like, they found out he was an MI6 spy or something. Like, right. <laughs> like, or he was, like, giving away British secrets to, like, the American government. Like, something. Something to get rid of him, knock him off the map. And then you find out that Pink Floyd, of all people, is involved. That would have been a way better story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, you know, speaking of frustration with characterization, something that bothered me a lot, and I agree with Jolie, like Ringo didn't feel like Ringo, um, George didn't feel like George, John was probably the closest to the Beatles because he's seen as being somewhat out there, interested in the mystical, but that's it. Paul, for like the three panels he's in, is given like no characterization, aside from whining. <laughs> Which is pretty accurate, I guess. But uh, <laughs> when we get to the car crash, there is this weird Hardy Boy sequence where John Lennon is looking and he's like, oh, there's no skid marks here. Right. It's like, right. how would you know? You're not a detective. <laughs> You're not in forensics. Yep. <laughs> Pink Floyd told him. <laughs> he's part of it. Yeah. And like... <laughs> Like, if you play like, Dark Side you... of the Moon backwards, it says, I killed Paul. <laughs> you, you know what? You know what? Maybe, it doesn't. Maybe, maybe, theory. maybe John killed Paul and he's just trying to cover his tracks by pointing out red herrings or, or like, you know, lying about shit. Like, look, there's no skin marks. I certainly <laughs> didn't do it. <laughs> Well, we are giving this book more credence than it deserves at this point. Wow. Right. Um, so here's a question is there is this like getting any attention critical attention or anything or well this book got a lot of solicitations so that's a huge thing like when this was announced i think what happened was people salivated at the art and mm. at the concept and i'll admit i selected this book to read i kind of did too because i thought what a great concept what amazing art how could mm. this not be good right well we found out wah, wah. <laughs> um, but not to be well actually Mike I'm sorry I don't want to interrupt you if you have a point or a question you want to ask no go ahead go ahead I want to focus on a few positive aspects because I know we've been kind of ragging on the book <laughs> there is one thing I really did enjoy in the section where Paul is confronting John he talks about how he doesn't feel like he's a person anymore you know, he's caught up in the whole whirlwind of being this cultural force with the Beatles. And he kind of just wants to reclaim his identity that he had when they were just kids playing in uh, a bar in Hamburg. And I liked that. Mm -hmm. If there was one aspect of the writing I could appreciate, that stood out for me because I thought that's the crux of the story right there. That's all you needed. I elaborate on that, but they didn't. Instead, it just kind of is brushed off and not really focused on again. I'm wondering, even though I have some criticisms of that, if there were any elements about the story that you enjoyed. No. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> can I just say one thing about that point, Adam? Yes, the please. I didn't like that point is because I know that of all the four Beatles, Paul would be the last person to say that. Uh, George Harrison quit the band, I think, three times. Ringo quit once, John quit twice, and if anyone wanted to stay in the band and enjoy the popularity and the stardom, it was Paul. So you talked earlier oh. about researching the characters or researching the band. It seemed like that was just way off base to have him be the one that didn't want to be a star anymore or whatever. Hmm. So I didn't like that, but... Yeah. Well, that's okay. You just killed the one thing I liked about the book. That's yeah. all right. <laughs> what was the movie that... Um, was about the Beatles. Backbeat? Do you mean yeah. like oh. Was it Backbeat? Or do you mean across across the universe or the one that came out last year or yesterday? No. Um it was like about Paul and John when they were younger, when they're like, getting to the band together. Backbeat. It was the big, big one, I think. Okay. So maybe it definitely was Backbeat. Because I remember that movie and going, 
Oh yeah, that's right. He was the one that was super into it. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. that makes more sense. They could have watched that movie and been like, "Yeah, he's a little more into it." Like they're, at this they're too point, busy. Uh, they're too busy researching Pink Floyd and uh, <laughs> all those other really pointless details. Yeah, because it's like, is it Ringo who has the the great wardrobe? It's like they they sure didn't forget that because. He's wearing fun ties. Even when they go to break into John's house, he's like wearing an inconspicuous, like multicolored suit. <laughs> Strange. Got my uh, breaking and entering jacket on. Yeah. <laughs> also, I just the, the idea. I don't know about favorite part. I think w- with this sort of like. Uh, switcheroo stories my favorite part is that everyone thinks that no one's gonna know like their best friend from this this impersonator like because he goes into he goes into it about how he's like oh don't you just miss like being a small band and playing instruments together like he kind of has like paddington bear vibes in this (laughs) jacket and like it's like, no, John would know. John would know immediately that, we're sorry, yes, John would know immediately that it's not Paul. Like, what, what there's no way that Paul McCartney's dead. Mm-hmm. Anyway, sorry, but that's my favorite part. The idea that people think that that's going to work and it never does. And then they always play it like it does. Which is stupid. Like, I would know. If someone replaced my sister with a doppelganger, mm-hmm. I would know by smell. Mm-hmm. You know, well, and especially if they tell the, they, they told them that Paul was dead. They're like, "Oh yeah, he's dead." And then what? You're just gonna sneak the doppelganger in there and be like, "Oh, there he is," and he's hiding out in his house in a raincoat. <laughs> like, why? Why is he? Oh. Yeah, how could they not find him? He was hiding in his house. That would be the first place I would look for someone. Yeah. <laughs> We've looked everywhere except for his house. Where could he be? That's so weird. I mean, understandably, they're not looking for him because he's dead. Or his whole body burnt in the fire. In the fire? Um, because they didn't go into those details. in this, And that's the thing. There are details about that car crash. Um, that are like explicit in real life that they didn't need. They just kind of were like, mm, it was a car accident in this book. And it was like, wow, you just did the bare minimum, didn't you? <laughs> and um, oh, anyway, sorry, it's just it's terrible. There is one more uh, narrative element I want to focus on because you're alluding to it a lot. There are these black and white sequences that happen sporadically in the graphic novel where it shows a Paul McCartney lookalike being interviewed. And it's this very serious scene where these people in big like Max or like big coats are like interviewing him, trying to assess how similar he is to Paul McCartney. So there is the implication throughout the book. Yes, they are hiring a double. They're hiring someone to eventually be Paul McCartney. But as Mike said, it was a cop-out because it's revealed at the very end, it's an unrelated story. It's just some guy who's part of a celebrity lookalike contest. Yeah. And that's when, as a reader, it makes me angry because it's like, do you think I'm stupid? Like, I, mm-hmm. yeah. Like, well, no, I think the writer's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's not, like, he just doesn't realize, how, like, no offense, but he doesn't realize how dumb his ideas are how like simplistic or amateur they are i guess like you know i've written my own stuff before and i know that when i was 19 or 20 what i thought was clever is like embarrassing now and that's what stage he is at no offense but maybe he will be a great writer one day but he's not yet you know yeah Yeah. and you know what would be like the best twist if it was actually real is if and it just came to me now because i was like why would they bring that into the story um, why would they name him? Uh, it's because he did win an, a lookalike contest. So it's like, what, the author I know accidentally maybe is saying this, but it's like, what if those are, that is what lookalike contests are for? They're to replace right. these celebrities yeah. when they mm-hmm. die so that people don't off themselves 
who are like super fan obsessed. Right. That would be um, that would make this book great Bummer. if that is what the author was actually trying to like. If that was one of the messages that the author was trying to speculate about, mm-hmm. is that like those competitions, those conventions of lookalikes? That's what this is for. It's to right. replace a population of people that are like uh, that might need replacing because they're so rich. Like, please say something about that. Like, <laughs> I don't. Uh, anyway, like at least draw the line and make it look like that's the conclusion you're coming to. Yeah, I agree with you, Jolie. Yeah, because he ended it on that, and I was like... But no, the, the reason why he ended it on that, and now that I'm thinking about it, it's like, no, it's because he, that was a real person. He did actually win. And people speculated that that man who won the competition is the doppelganger. So they're just doing a whole, like, bringing together facts still. And it's... Ugh. God, they're not saying anything about stuff we already know. <laughs> anyway, right. sorry, I'm getting worked up and it's 91 degrees in here. It's, it's, it's getting a little hot in here. Yeah. Little mm-hmm. down. Um, I, I do agree with you, and I think you articulated it perfectly. It's saying nothing. Like, even the point about, you know, the trappings of fame that I kind of liked until Mike ruined it for me, which I appreciate. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to be of service. Anytime, yeah. Uh, but really, it's not saying anything. And I don't feel like every story has to have a clearly laid out moral, but it should say something beyond the surface level. And the surface is pretty in this book, but that's all there is. In fact, characterization is null and zero. They don't talk like Liverpudians. I think that's the term. Liverpudians, is that it? Yeah. Pud- Liver- Liverpudlians, I think. Pudlians. If, if anyone if from Liverpool is actually going like, to see yeah. this, they're going to be very upset. But uh, yeah, there's just no authenticity at all. This felt like, and, and I'm sorry because I know uh, Paulo is a published author, but it felt more like bad fan fiction yeah. than a publishable story. Mm-hmm. Yep. It, it, it almost strikes me as if you were to have a film set in Vegas and you never left the hotel room and it wasn't even a nice hotel room. It was like one of those chintzy motel rooms. And, and so you're, it's like, you're wait, like you said, it's a waste. Like you've picked this incredibly rich moment in time that you could have taken full advantage of. And you, you didn't, it'd be like that. It'd be like just having a movie in Vegas and you never leave the hotel room. Like, I agree. That's a great analogy. I don't have a lot of other questions to ask, so maybe <laughs> we can just go around and give final thoughts. Although I have, an, I have an inkling. I know what they might be. Um, oh, can I complain so, about there being an epilogue that like doesn't do anything for this? Oh, uh, yes, yes, please. Yes. Please complain about that. One. Okay. Cool. Um, this is the first time I've read an epilogue in a fucking, excuse me, in a, in a graphic novel. Am I wrong? Like, nope. Whoa. Yep. Well, Maybe in a graphic. What Hunter. other graphic novel does this? Well, 80s comics did it all the time. But, but it would just be like the last page would say epilogue. And then it would be like, you know, Dr. Octopus's hand would come up from the water and that would be it, you know, or whatever. That was the epilogues back then. Usually, yeah, in serialized comics, not so much in standalone graphic novels. Right. I mean, I I'm sure there's some that exist that are decent, but okay. this is a very unnecessary one. Correct me if I'm wrong. Was there an epilogue in, um, um, Oh, my God. I'm totally blanking on the name of that graphic novel. Uh, Rorschach is in it. Oh, my God. Oh, Watchmen? Watchmen. <laughs> yes, Watchmen. Didn't they have an epilogue in Watchmen? They, yeah, but they didn't call it, I don't think they called it that, but technically mm. it was an epilogue, yeah. You know what would have been really cool as an epilogue? Because the whole purpose of this is for them to just kind of say, look, look, look at all these historical events that we recreated in this graphic novel. So I think a cooler thing would have been to show fake newspaper headlines to show that, hey, this actually happened. Like, obviously it's a graphic novel. You're not going to put the real newspaper clipping in there, but you could make it look like, here's the newspaper clipping and maybe someone will go look it up. You know, like that would have been a better, less wordy waste of time. 
be. Uh huh. Yeah, and it, it's, it almost serves as if to say, just before you think we're crazy fanfic conspiracy believers, we don't really believe it because believing it would be, but like believing, insert this crazy ass like football analogy at the end about like, what is his name? Diego Armando Maradona. Like, what does that have to do with this? Are you are you British? Are you that British that you had to talk about football in this graphic novel anyway? When it, it really bothered me, like you guys said, they spent a lot of time on John hanging upside down. And so when they said, Oh, that didn't actually happen, it was it was suggested, but it never actually happened. I was like, dude. Like you so just, how often did you think about it? Clearly a lot, because you drew yeah. it a bunch of damn time. <laughs> I think they oh just want to see John hanging upside down. Yeah, and like, I love these fun marker drawings, though, in the art. There's like that caterpillar, sort of a caduceus snake, but it's like like a treble clef. Mm-hmm. There's also mm-hmm. this caterpillar parachute that's really cute. <laughs> like, to, I don't know, to me... Okay, I'm just going to echo something that Mike said earlier, which was, it was very like... First year textbook 101, um, we learned a bunch of stuff in music history class and we thought about it so much and doodled about it so much that we made a book about it. That's what the epilogue reeks of to me is that it's just very hit yourself over the head with more info. It's like Mm -hmm. before you can't take it seriously, look how much we learned. Like these are didn't, these are the doodles yeah. straight from the margins of that class. That that's how bad it is. Yeah, right. the snake doesn't show up at all, does it? I don't think so. I think that was the only instance of it. Yeah, it's really weird. Um, yeah. like I think maybe they tried to maybe they wanted to include it in the LSD like psychedelia part, but it just didn't work out very well. Hmm. Yeah, no, it just like. It reeks of that to me because that was me in first year, just talking about everything I learned from the textbook, like a like a parrot, like to the annoyance of family, friends, and anyone with an earshot. Like, I think that's the curse of being an undergrad, though. Yeah, uh, it just seemed like this whole narrative reeked of breaking Chekhov's gun. Yeah, that whole notion where you have to have something introduced which serves a purpose. All these things are introduced serving no purpose whatsoever. Even the yep. impersonator thing as a wah, wah moment That's at right. the end. Yep. It didn't even have a good payoff because you already knew he was not going to be Paul before they revealed what that was all about. Yep. I know. <sighs> yeah. It's like writing 101. He doesn't get any of it. Now, I do want to defend the author. I, I know, in spite of everything. In one point, both him and the artist are Italian artists. Italian? So, or Italian. Italian. Oh, no. Italian. The Italians. They're, but, <laughs> but they are Italian, uh, an Italian author and artist. So is this a work in translation? I, I can't oh. find any credits for a translator. I think uh, Paolo Baron actually wrote this in English. And if that's not his primary language... There could be some issues with dialogue or even direction of the story. So I'm wondering if that could impede the story from really reaching that potential. Speaking as someone who reads a lot of translated works, I don't think this was translated. Mm -hmm. Uh, It is possible that he could have written it in English. It, It just doesn't have the flavor of being translated because you can still... When something's translated into English from another language, you can still feel the beats of, or the tempo of that other language beneath it. And I didn't get that. Um, oh, oh, wait, before we I, continue on, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. You, I, I did find know. out it was translated. No way. Whoa. No way. Okay, well, that's still no excuse for a terrible story or a terrible plot. Mm-hmm. That's no excuse. Well, the other In thing- another plot turn, they're the Beatles' biggest fans. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Sorry, Michael. Uh, I was going to say, also, plot does not really get lost in translation, and the plot yeah. is garbage. Yeah. True, true. 
no that it's no excuse i've read again i've read tons of stuff that's translated and and the storyline does not suffer for it mm-hmm. yeah and it's like it's the plot is garbage because it's like well we know the plot now we know the plot and even as somebody who wasn't familiar with the conspiracy it's like you're retelling something to somebody who doesn't know but there are all these other people who do know and it's still not interesting mm-hmm. boys come on I, mean, I don't, <laughs> yeah. don't want to assume your gender but come on <laughs> i'm just gonna say it uh I think this is the poorest graphic novel we've read in any iteration of the group. Uh, <laughs> even even oh. Angel Catbird. No, no. I, was probably no, finish, I would say you have to read this to see how bad it is. Mm. This, That's I would true. not even recommend anyone read. I would say go to Google image search, check out some great images that the artist did. Don't bother flipping through it. Maybe see if he has an Etsy and go support the poor guy's work and maybe he can write his own books and they'll be better. Oh, he's only ever worked with Paulo Baron before, so I guess they're like best buds. I don't know. Someone needs to stop that. <laughs> go back in time. We'll go back in time and just drop a better script into their mailbox. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like honestly, if anyone if anyone wants to deep dive, like one, I would just be like, hey, did you know that there are Hundreds of people that thought that Paul McCartney died in a car crash in the sixties. That is your better story, and then you just go, "Yes, there are many YouTube videos about it. I suggest you watch those. There may have been some books written too, and a graphic recent graphic novel. Maybe save that one for last." Like, <laughs> I wouldn't say this is if you're a conspiracy Beatles conspiracy theory completist. Sure. Go ahead. Have a look at this book just to know that they got some stuff right. Well, they got all of the none of none of it was like like a sorry. None of it was fictionalized. Is that the right word? Um, well, I mean, we as far as we know, Paul McCartney never actually wanted to enlist a double to replace him, so that's potentially fictionalized yeah. and also we know that john didn't actually hang upside down mm-hmm. uh, okay. so it's let's say not fictionalized as much as embellished mm-hmm. yes. so it's like do you know what the majority of the facts because they will tell you in the book are scooped from actual history um yeah just go read something else <laughs> yep uh, I honestly want to know more about this guy, though. Um, the impersonator. William Campbell Shears. Hmm. Hey, can we to... get a comic about this guy? Yeah. <laughs> like, could you imagine being, like, looking like Paul McCartney for the rest of your life? Like, Stephen Hargraves' dad looks like Paul McCartney. I tell him all the time. And he doesn't believe me. They don't think that it's right. I was like, no, no, no. You look like Paul McCartney for sure. But, like, this guy, if he really looks like Paul McCartney, imagine what his life would have been like. Just girls running after him. Insane women. And men. Well, on that note, I do want to say, if anyone is looking for a decent Beatles comic book, there was one called The Fifth Beatle. And this was released back in 2013, This actually got quite a bit of critical acclaim upon its release, and it features basically a recounting of Brian Epstein's life and his career with the Beatles. So I read that. It was really, it was good. Yeah. So if you are looking for a good Beatles comic, the talk about this one has made you salivate a little bit more for something with quality. Definitely check that out. Um, Highly recommended. I wish that one would have been on our platform to view instead of this, but is what it is this is also something else fun if you want to kind of immerse yourself in beatles lore this is a really great book it's backwards i'm sorry it's called the time traveler's handbook and it's set up as like this guide where here's this company that sends you back in time to witness historical events and the beatles becoming a band and their rise to popularity is one of them and so it very historically actually historically accurate 
Glee. That's awkward. Um, outlines all of it as if you are there. And it's a lot of fun. They also do Mount Vesuvius erupting, so you can like go see that happening. And it's a fun book. Thanks. Better than this one. But it's not a graphic <laughs> novel, so sorry, we're breaking from the medium. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, with this said, um, I don't know, I think we pretty much have buried this. Uh, <laughs> More than Paul, that's for sure. Oh, because he's not dead. <laughs> Is uh, that the only one still alive right now? Uh, Ringo's oh, also alive. Not that anyone yeah, cares. Oh, yeah. Ooh, I think it's actually going to be funny because I guarantee Paul will last. He'll outlive the other th three. He'll outlive Ringo, too. Well, you know, well, he no, takes no, care of himself. We're only down to two Beatles. Yeah, so that's what I'm saying. He'll outlive Ringo. Okay. <laughs> got it. Got it. I understand what you mean now. <laughs> oh, so guys, um, I don't know anything else to add about this comic. It was really fun to rip on. <laughs> I do agree. It's probably the, the story is the worst graphic novel I've ever read, probably, except maybe Angel Catbird. <laughs> They're definitely close contenders. <laughs> Julie, I see you smiling silently. <laughs> Oh yeah, I'm just agreeing. Angel Catbird is garbage. It is hot <laughs> garbage. And that there could potentially be a sequel is like troubling. Oh, what actually the they completed. Yeah. yeah, they made the whole trilogy. Yeah, that's right. Oh, sorry. I love Johnny Christmas though, so. Well, it's okay. The next book we're going to read is Angel Catbird 2. No, we're not. Uh -huh. we're, we're not going, I know, not even funny. I know where you're like. Boycott. <laughs> Better stop. <laughs> but with that said, maybe we should talk about the next comic we're going to discuss. Sure. Okay, so this one I have much higher expectations and better feelings about. This <laughs> is uh, from Fantagraphic Books, which usually they produce stuff I really enjoy. Uh, it's by Paco Roca, and it's called Wrinkles. Wrinkles. <laughs>